Welcome to Masters of Regeneration Radio. Conversations with humans who dare to reimagine our place on planet Earth. Earth is changing fast. Evolution happening in real time. An intimate, circular understanding of nature and living systems. We are the land. The land is us. When trees are very thirsty, they begin to scream. You won't hear it because it happens at ultrasonic levels. Vibrations occur in the trunk when the flow of water from the roots to the leaves is interrupted. We know how the sounds are produced, and if we were to look through a microscope to examine how humans produce sounds, what we would see wouldn't be that different. The passage of air down the windpipes causes our vocal cords to vibrate. When I think about the research results, it seems to me that these vibrations could be much more than just vibrations. They could be cries of thirst. The trees might be screaming out a dire warning to their colleagues that water levels are running low. Peter Volobin Hey everyone, welcome to episode 15 of Masters of Regeneration Radio. Thank you so much if you have been to Apple Podcasts or iTunes and left us five stars. Those stars and reviews, if you have the time to write a little something, go a super long way to help us grow. Um, thank you all of you who have signed up for our newsletter as well. Go to mastersofregeneration.com if you haven't. And um, thank you so much for those of you who have also perched, uh, purchased tote bags and t-shirts and hoodies and, and a bunch of other cool stuff that we have on the website because we haven't even officially launched our campaign. So that's awesome. And uh, today, a very, very dear episode for Thanksgiving together with episode 14, which I hope you already listened to this week, is kind of focused on the plant kingdom in a way. In The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Volobin shares his deep love of woods and forests and explains the amazing processes of life, death, and regeneration he has observed in the woodland and the amazing scientific processes behind the wonders of which we are blissfully unaware. Much like human families, tree parents live together with their children, communicate with them, and support them as they grow sharing nutrients with those who are sick or struggling and creating an ecosystem that mitigates the impact of extremes of heat and cold for the whole group. As a result of such interactions, trees in a family or community are protected and can live to be very old. In contrast, solitary trees like street kids have a tough time and in most cases die much earlier than those in a group. Very excited for this episode 15 with Peter Volobin. Peter is a German forester and author who writes on ecological themes in popular language. In his book that I loved called The Hidden Life of Trees, which he published in 2016, he explores how trees are social organisms, what they feel and how they communicate. I want to talk today mostly about language and communication because I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated with the flow of biological information between organisms and in this particular case with Peter, um, the flow of biological information between our very, very, very slow relatives <laughs> called <laughs> trees. Um, uh, we can only really understand plants and trees by looking at a very very small and very slow scales um, I love that's why I love time lapses because they allow us to kind of see the plant kingdom at a speed that we are more familiar with so without further ado here's Peter Volben Peter welcome to the show thank you very much Thomas <laughs> yes so what I imagine for this episode with you is a conversation that focuses on 
communication, like I was saying, on intelligence in, in nature, in super organisms like forests, and uh, how all this communication happens. Um, and, and also something you touched on in your book, which was the difference between wild forests and planted forests and domesticated trees, let's say. How about we start with your origin story? When was the moment you decided you wanted to share all these findings and all these deep insights from your work with trees with everyone else? Um, after the special, <laughs> there, there were, were many special moments, and the special moments were with my wife Miriam because she always asked, Peter, when do you start to, to write down all your guided tours? Uh, which, which I used to do in, in person, not, not by books. And um, for many years, I refused to do so because I, I'm, I'm not a writer uh, who wants to let it flow out all uh, into the paper. No, uh, usually I, I like to talk to the people. And um, but the people were always asking where to read more about uh, the, the things I'm, I'm telling them and uh, then after years I gave up my resistance I said okay Miriam I, I'm going to write write a book and uh, send it to several publishers and if no one wants to have it that's it <laughs> that's how it started <laughs> so did you actually write the whole book and then send it to publishers yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but not, not this book not, not this book but, um, yeah. uh, the, the hidden map of trees was the 16th book I wrote so far, and uh, oh, wow. well, the first, okay. well, the first one, a similar topic. Uh, I started in 2007, and uh, I'm, I sent it to several, several publishers. And yes, of course, <laughs> there, there were some who, who wanted to have it. <laughs> Beautiful. So to start with, you used to do tours. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What, what did that entail? Um, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm a forester, forester thin, since uh, 30 years, and um, I always love to to make guided tours a little bit different by uh, by just telling people uh, this is a beech tree, this is an oak tree, and you can tell it this by the leaf shape. I, I, I always found that boring, and I, I loved much more to tell them about the latest research. For example, that trees communicate, that they care for their offspring, and uh, how to see that uh, in, in, in the forest, uh, uh, what indicators are there for tree lovers and uh, uh, or trees which which don't like each other, and uh, so yeah, that that's interesting. And and the the people who went with me on the guided tours, they were my trainers because uh, at first. I told them more in technical terms, like you can read that in scientific reports. And, and, and I realized instantly that the people were discussing and telling about other things and about their neighbors, whatsoever. They, they uh, weren't listen, listening to me. So that's a hard training. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very that's excellent. I, ch I changed my, my wording. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember my first television um, event uh, and I were, were very proud uh, and, and watching with my family the, the little TV show and uh, and uh, but they they were just watching the TV show counting the A's and S and they say, yeah look you 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 did it again to say uh, and uh, uh, searching for words so uh, even my family was was a hard training for me but a good training and after, let's say, 20 years, I, I, I think <laughs> I, it was really good in telling stories without technical terms, without A's and O's. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy that I had this, this training. <laughs> yeah, training usually isn't fun. And the, the best learning comes from, you know, making a lot of mistakes and being corrected, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so... Tell us a little bit more about what you mentioned in where you were presenting people. Trees communicate. Trees have very intricate and intimate social networks. Could you, uh, do you unpack you where... that wisdom for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. um, the first, um, the first uh, contact with uh, tree, uh, the tree social system I had in the early 1980s. Um, when I start uh, um, study forestry, um, and that verse was, we were told that uh, trees were are sharing uh, poison. For example, in, in this time, um, this um, broadleaf trees were poisoned with Agent Orange in Germany, 
uh, because uh, foresters then would like to have uh, more conifers because they are, they are better to sell. Okay. The timber is better to sell. And then we were told when you poison one tree, um, be careful because the surrounding trees also die uh, because they share the poison. That was the first contact with the tree social system. And of course, trees which have a history as long as 300 million years, they have never been in contact with Agent Orange, so, so they don't have a strategy against Agent Orange. They, they usually they share sugar. Yeah. And uh, when I started as a, as a forester, I very soon uh, realized that um, a forester is more like a tree butcher uh, than, than, a, than, a, than a forest keeper. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's okay to use trees, but uh, to say uh, I'm the keeper of a forest by killing trees, that's perhaps the... the the wrong um, term. So, uh, and and that hit my heart because I um, I then worked in the state forest commission, and they were told to I was told to cut old uh, mother trees because uh, of selling timber, and uh, then very soon I realized that I I don't uh, care for the forest, but I'm destroying forests. So I changed my point of view. I read a lot of scientific reports. I uh, traveled around to forest um, districts, which which are managed much more environmentally friendly. And then I found more and more out: hey, trees are cooperating. And um, in the early 1990s, um, there were no. It, it's, it dates back to the early 1970s that okay. the first reports came out that trees are communicating. And the the first. Um, uh, the first uh, reports on that came from Africa, from the savannas, from acacia trees, which are communicating and defending their leaves against uh, giraffes, for example. And uh, they do it with a chemical uh, warning call um, that uh, giraffes are approaching. And trees, we don't, we know. Meanwhile, they are able to taste um, through the saliva which animal is feeding on them. Wow. But, and, on this time, it was just that the, the trees are communicating and that, that uh, the trees, all surrounding trees, are pumping poisonous substances in their leaves to get rid of those big mammals. So uh, that was the first information. Then uh, I've learned that trees are also communicating through their root system, and even through a fungi system. It's like our our web and so the the magazine Nature called it in around about 1995 the wood wide web. Wood so wide it, web. Beautiful. Wood wide web. Uh, that yes. expression is 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 uh, pretty old, uh, yeah. but it sounds sounds uh, like a sensation. But on, among scientists, it's old. And um, we learn now more and more and more about tree communication. We know that each each species has sometimes hundreds of different, let's say, words. Um, to communicate, we know that uh, that it is a real communication because it's not just one way. Uh, in one way, it would be something like a reflex, but okay. on two ways, when you get a response, it's a communication. Uh, we don't know very much about that, but what we know is uh, is really amazing, and we know that uh, trees, for example, are not so much different from from animals. How so? Pardon? How are they not so different? Um, yeah, they are, they are in many things. They are not not different. For example, um, trees can feel pain. And that's a uh, strong research being done, for example, at the universities of Bonn in Germany or Florence in Italy or uh, in Perth in Australia. And um, they found out that um, trees uh, or plants in general can really feel pain. Uh, now I hear many foresters uh, who say, ah, oh, no, that's, that's esoteric. Uh, there, we know that, for example, when, it, when a, a bug bites in bark, that the tree that there is an electrical signal through the tissue, that there is a defending reaction with poisonous substances, but you can call that a reflex. But for pain, for feeling pain, you need to be something like conscious. And what we know uh, nowadays is it's a very late research, uh, news research, for example, from the University of Bonn, that plants are producing something like uh, the opiates we produce in our body to suppress pain. For example, when you're in the shock under shock reaction okay. um, to produce opiates helps you not to realize the pain uh, and to, to be able to react. Uh, so uh, we find that even in plants, they produce substances to suppress pain. That means that 
pain is a little bit more than a reflex. So that it is something like uh, in conscious for a plant. So, um, and what we what else do we know? We know that there, um, there are is research being done on plants with sedation. They are sedated with uh, with the same anesthetics like uh, in uh, human operations. And uh, when you um, uh, give such such uh, chemicals to a plant. Yeah. All the electrical uh, processes are slowing down, and the production of this pain suppressing substances is also uh, done. So it's ex the, uh, exactly the same reaction like uh, we have when we are uh, under anesthetics uh, in an operation. Oh, so that's uh, beautiful. <laughs> that's awesome. Closer and closer yeah. and closer to us. Um, and the, the question is. Is there really such a big difference between animals and plants? Perhaps you may tell me what is the difference between animals and plants? What, what would you guess? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a question for you. Oh, it's a question for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's a it's a it's a very dear topic for for me because um, I've seen so many friends throughout the years in the U.S., in Europe, in South America. Um, who become vegetarian or vegan and take on this yeah. this big mission to to let us omnivores people who eat you know animals yeah. know how how bad we are how cruel and I've always said well I don't see when I look at at nature I just see life taking different forms it's a transfer of energy uh, to me it's all alive I had no arguments to really explain how I uh, more deeply what I felt. Right. Yeah, yeah. When yeah, I read and, and, your book yeah, so, and other books, it kind of illustrated yeah. that, and I was like, "Oh well, I had read that, for example, plants create because, and and this is something I used to tell my vegan friends, you know, at least some of the food that I eat can run for their life, right? But plants, they cannot run, <laughs> so they have <laughs> these these uh, weapons. They have chemicals, you know, they have poison, they have these other things, like you were explaining when." when a tree is defending itself against a giraffe, for example. Yeah, yeah. And to me, I don't know, the main difference to me is just a matter of, of, um, la of both language and time scale, maybe like the rhythm at which they move, you know, because we don't, it's hard for us to see a plant moving, but when we see a, a time lapse, we see it moving. Right, right. yeah. Um, the, the main biological difference is that plants produce their own food through photosynthesis and uh, animals don't. They, they have to, to uh, feed on, on other beings. That's oh, the course. main difference. Yes. Yes. Uh, I myself, I'm a vegetarian, so, uh, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't make any rules or I don't judge people who, who eat meat or, or whatsoever because I think it's a personal decision and for me it's, uh, it has a little bit more to do with um, the, um, the uh, um, environmental footprint uh, we leave. But I think I would leave that up to everyone uh, without judging it, because I think it's it's something we, we would say in German it's a, a sour moral uh, discussion. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's more important how we treat beings in general, whether that yes. are animals or plants, before we use them. And that's um, the new thing. I don't want to say regions, you aren't right, because plants can also communicate and can feel pain. I would say to everyone. Uh, perhaps we can treat even plants with more respect. And I know it's it's a long way because we, we haven't reached the state that we treat animals with good respect. So uh, I think, and plants, uh, we have, to be honest, we have a, a ranking uh, in the um, living kingdom with humans at the top, then, we, then comes animals, and uh, the highest ranks are chimpanzees and dolphins, the lowest ranks are spiders and flies and so on. And then uh, we have the plants, well, the highest ranks trees, the lowest ranks algae, for example. So, uh, but this ranking is an emotional ranking. It's yeah. not the scientific ranking. Because on the scientific scale, they are all equal. And yes. on a moral scale, they should also all, all, all be equal. Um, and uh, that's exactly the point. I have more, if I, feel, I feel more love to, with a chimpanzee than, than with a fly or with grass. Uh, but it's because they are evolutionary scenes so close to me. 
and uh, yeah. and grass is, is is not very close. And even if I know that grass is able to communicate, even by sound, as we know nowadays, for example, they um, uh, grass is able to uh, make click sounds uh, at 200 hertz frequency, and the other roots uh, of other grass um, beings they uh, grow in this direction. We don't know why. It's basic research. Or, for example, we know when when corn plants. Uh, come into contact with each other, with the, with the leaves. Uh, there is an electrical signal running through the corn plant, running through the roots, and this corn plant inform its neighbors that it's that it come into contact with the neighboring corn plants. That's also research, for example, from the University of Bonn, which is really well known for good research. So we don't know why corn plants are doing this, but we know there is, there is communication, there is a sense for contact, we know there is a sense for pain, and all I want to say with that, that's basic research. And from this on, we should start a discussion how to treat plants. That's excellent. And it's so important. I mean, I think I I am an omnivore, but I, I only purchase grass-fed meats from ranches that I know, you know, are taking yeah. care of the cows in, in the most... Um, natural possible environment and letting the cows choose which grasses to eat at which time of the year and so on and so forth and the same for plants i i try i i travel a lot but i try not to buy you know vegetables that are industrially produced because because that's just as damaging to to the environment right right so right. i agree yeah. with you in the sense that um, just having this this idea, this more horizontal idea of how important every single organism is in the in the balance and in, in the ecology. I mean, yeah. we owe our oxygen to plants. So why are they in the lowest ranking? And, and to algae in the yeah. ocean and plankton, right? Um, right. Do plants eat um, through their roots? Do no, they um... matter as well or not? Or, or is uh, it just general, the nutrients broken down from decomposing animals in the ground? Yeah, not, not just just animals. And sometimes, in, in some cases, um, uh, the fungi uh, helps the plants to kill animals uh, for nutrition purpose. Uh, that's, for example, when there is a lack of nitrogen in the lack of nitrogen in the in the soil. The fungi realize this, that, and then they send out poisonous substances for those little mites and insects and they kill them and when they are decomposing the the nitrogen is um, available for the, the tree so plants are not always nice to animals um, <laughs> but uh, in general plants are producing their food with um, with their leaves um, yeah. and they're producing producing sugar and they just need minerals with uh, uh, well um, and the roots are um, pumping these minerals together with water uh, out of the soil but what is more interesting for me um, concerning the roots is that in the root tips there are brain-like structures. And the first first um, scientist to uh, guess that there may be brain-like structures in the root tips was uh, Charles Darwin. So um, it was forgotten forgotten for uh, around about 100 years, and then afterwards the modern scientist um, came up with the topic again and. Then they found out in the root tips are brain-like structures. There are electrical processes going on, brain-like processes. And um, uh, one Polish forest scientist told me that he think that the, the, all the root tips together may work as uh, like a like a computer cloud, as a, as a brain which is uh, um, all over uh, the root tips uh, in, in little parts. We are always searching, uh, uh, when we search a brain in a plant, we would say, okay, there's no no big uh, dot of protein uh, with which weights a kilo or more. Uh, um, we don't search for, for those millions and millions little parts of the brain which may work together. That's just a guess, but there are strong uh, hints that it may be like that, may work together. Uh, like our brain, not not exactly like our brain. I haven't seen so far trees writing books yeah. <laughs> or flying to the moon. But uh, but we know that a tree works together as a whole organism, and that it's not just a reaction on yeah, le let's say like like reflex. But that a tree, for example, is even able to store memories. We don't know where so far, but we know that trees are able to learn, and you can see that in the forest. Um, you can see when you or in your garden when you have a tree. 
uh, for for decades. Um, a broadleaf tree, for example, like a maple or oak or whatsoever, in the in the uh, northern parts of your country where they throw off your, the leaves in winter time, uh, then you can see that this is a strategy when they drop off their leaves, and um, because they have to drop uh, the leaves uh, off by a decision. And the decision um, is depending on when the weather, uh, when the winter will come. Because when we have a heavy snow lo load on the crown, the big branches may break. So you have to get rid, rid of your leaves as a tree before the first snow uh, will fall. And the tree don't know this. The tree don't is not very good in the, in the weather forecast. So um, some trees which are more careful, they say, ah, okay, let's drop off the leaves a little bit earlier because last year we had a very early snowfall. And the more that the, the tougher trees say, ah, no, we always had a golden October, uh, Indian summer, and so we can have the leaves longer on, produce more sugar for the winter when yeah. trees are hibernating, like like grizzly bears, for example. Yeah. Many people don't think about what trees are doing in the winter time. They, yeah. Sleep. Yeah, yeah. they sleep, and they are course, just yeah. yeah, and they are just breathing CO2 out. They are breathing uh, oxygen in and CO2 out. A winter forest is producing not a single atom of oxygen. Interesting. Mm, so, why is it important? Why does it matter to understand this for us as um, consumers? Um, at, at the first side, there's no reason. For me, it's it's uh, interesting because I'm curious and okay. I like to see what's going on there. And um, that's exactly what, what I try to, to bring uh, over in my books. That I don't don't want to give the people advice to how yeah. to behave afterwards, how to how to shop, uh, how to uh, use timber, uh, because when you, for example, when you look at, at an elephant, you don't think uh, about what the elephant is doing for the environment or for the climate or for our our benefits. You you just enjoy, yeah. And by enjoying such a, an elephant or a sperm whale or orca, uh, you say, wow. It, it would be a shame to kill the, those animals. And um, when you love trees, I think you don't need laws, but and, and uh, you don't need an advice how to how to behave in the forest. When you love trees, I think you you will reduce your your wood consumption. Or for example, as you say, you're an omnivore. You 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 uh, when you see those animals, you say, okay, when I want to eat meat, and if I have the possibility to have, or if I have a choice in the supermarket, yes. for example, then I would choose. A steak from from uh, um, from cattle which is raised uh, um, um, organic in an organic sense and uh, exactly you can do that with timber. For example, my, uh, I'm myself eating with firewood. That sounds strange, strange for a forest uh, <laughs> where, uh, who for, uh, writes a book like the Hidden Life of Trees. But I'm not against the use of timber. Where I'm, I'm sitting here on a wonderful wooden desk from from a dead elm tree which died from a beetle attack. Okay. Uh, I think uh, timber use is a wonderful thing, but we shouldn't treat trees uh, like an like, um, in, in industrial animal keeping. And that's exactly what's going on. I've uh, been in um, uh, the beginning of October in British Columbia, and what I've seen there, that's really very sad, because there are, in most uh, cases, the primeval forests are gone. They treat the, the the big big forest there like plantations. They are trying to, to start the fertilization of this forest now to get keep them grow uh, much much faster. It's it's like like growing yeah. pigs and pig stables to get them very fast ready to the market. And that's exactly yeah. the use of timber I don't like. In British Columbia, that was in British Columbia. We were, we flew over there with a the film crew because we make a documentary on the hidden life of trees. Okay, uh, for the cinemas. And we wanted to see primeval forest in comparison to uh, managed forest in comparison to clear cuts. And what we found are were managed forests and clear cuts, but not no primeval no primeval forest. Seventy kilometers, or let's say fifty miles from the next road um, away, we we didn't found a primeval forest, and that was really sad. Um, you mentioned something very interesting in your book between the difference and. and uh, about the difference between uh, wild forests and trees and all the communication and memory and exchange that is happening compared to a domesticated forest or, uh, yeah. you know, could, could, 
could you tell us a little bit about that, about what happens to this capacity of trees to organize and, and share this in this communication? Yeah, um, in a domesticated forest, let's say in a plantation, that's exactly what it is. Okay. Um, um, at first, the root system is damaged because trees are, are raised in, an, uh, in a tree nursery, so-called, and to keep the root ball small, because then you can it, it transport it better, you can plant it better, it is cut uh, in, into a, uh, so that you have a, a smaller root ball, but it is damaged. Um, and as you can imagine, it is a very heavy damage to cut all the root tips mm -hmm. with the brain-like structures. Yeah, they will yeah. recover. Yeah, they, <laughs> what it does to humans, uh, we, 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 we can imagine. But it's a good for metaphor. Trees, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to mention any, yes. any first but <laughs> the, the damaged, <laughs> damaged root system in his head. But uh, the brain-like structures are gone. They will recover, but not in the same quality. And that's exactly that. And you can see that that plant trees always root flat. And many people think they are flat rooting tree species and deep rooting tree species. And that's nonsense. All tree species like to root deep. But after having the root system uh, being cut, uh, the, all trees root flat for the rest of their life. And that means that they, they uh, can be easily uh, thrown in a storm. Or, for example, in a dry summer, think about climate change, they can't reach the deeper layer of the soil for water. So uh, when, the, when the forest is suffering from climate change, we often say, ah, that's climate change. No, it's forestry, and, um, and on top we get the climate change. In, in um, intact uh, primeval forests, climate change is not a problem. It's a problem for us, the climate change, but not for intact forest. Yeah. What's even more important, in such a damaged root system, um, even the, the adult trees are no longer able to communicate. They are not no longer able to connect the root system and to share sugar, to support each other. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's exactly like in industrial animal keeping where you have pigs. Uh, they are all even aged without uh, adult pigs. And they are very young and very unhealthy. And um, so if there's an infection and a virus, for example, uh, it's, we, we read sometimes in newspapers, newspapers that the, the whole population of a big stable die because uh, of um, inf infections. So it's exactly what we see on beetle inf infections, bark beetles, uh, for example, on lodge pines, uh, lodgepole pines. Uh, that are damaged forests, heavily damaged forests, which are instable. And for me, it's no wonder uh, that forests like this easily are burning and easily are um, infested by, by bugs. Yeah. Is that happening in Europe too? The bark beetle? Yeah. Because okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I exactly. saw in Northern California, in Yosemite, for example, and, and other forests, there was a lot of bark beetle invasions. So it's... Yeah. It's... And the bark beetles has always been with the trees, always. And each t uh, tree species has its own bark beetle, or often many bark beetle species, which are spe specialized just on weak trees. And a healthy tree is able to defend itself, because otherwise it would, be, uh, would have been wiped out uh, during the uh, millions of years of evolution. So a healthy tree is able to, to handle a, a bark beetle, but a uh, weak tree isn't. So we have many weak trees, so... The bark beetles can um, kill hundreds and thousands of square kilometers of, of forest. And we have that exactly in Germany, and especially in this year. Uh, we don't, don't have it as bad as uh, in California with uh, those big fires. And uh, we were very, very sad about uh, the news of all those people killed in those fires and lost their homes. And that and they are not guilty, as some politicians say, because they built their houses there. They are, no, I think that's really that's climate change. And that's the lack of intact forest ecosystems. And uh, we have that exactly in Germany, too. We don't have that big wildfires because our forests are much smaller. So you know, that's the only difference. But the, the methods of forestry are exactly the same. So we have big plantations with conifers, which don't belong to Germany. We have usually we have beech trees and oak trees in, in our forest. But in Germany, for example, we don't have any single square meter of primeval forest left. That's a difference to the United States. So uh, wow. I'm not I'm not uh, the person who uh, may judge the, the things um, American foresters do because in Germany it's even worse. But the main yeah. difference is 
we are better in PR. <laughs> 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 oh, because we, we say, hey, we have invented sustainability since 300 years. We are sustainable. No, that's not true. <laughs> we changed our wonderful primary forest to conifer plantations, which was, for example, with American species like Douglas fir, which is not common in Germany, uh, which is, is a wonderful tree. And I've seen that in North America. So it's a wonderful forest tree. But in Germany, it's, it's, uh, it's native like uh, oil palm in, in uh, Borneo. Okay. So in Germany, it's a problem, and uh, we have wildfires because of that, and we have uh, we lose many species of our native forest species, like bugs and spiders, because they are not used to live in conifer plantations. Of course. Hmm. <laughs> <Some> challenges. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but, uh, but uh, what, what's very important for me to say? Yes. Forest ecosystems are very strong. And as long as you give them around about 500 years, they are there again in full health and, and with full equipment of species. Just 500 years. And you okay. see, wow, 500 years, that sounds very long. But that is not a single um, tree uh, generation. It's just 500 years. A tree gen generation is around about 1,000 years. So 50% uh, of a tree generation, that means in, in human time frame, 50, uh, 40 years. And for trees, 500 years, that's nothing. But for us, it's too late. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, and yeah. so was, if we, we, uh, when we talk about protecting forests, we just talk about protecting ourselves. We don't need to protect forests. Even the, the Amazon rainforest or in Indonesia, it's really a shame what's going on there. But I'm very sure that when you give those forests the remaining little patches, just 500 years they're back again as if they were never destroyed. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the whole the whole point. I think is the, the you know the planet's not at risk. It's us. It's the conditions that allow us to be alive today, right? <laughs> exactly. That's exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. And I love to think about those things. It it gives me so much awareness to to talk about those different time scales and also about the different perceptions. Like we don't hear because we're limited yeah. by our center of perception, our brain, to mm -hmm. as to what we can hear, what we can see, and all that. I love that yeah. um, that um, paragraph in your book where you talked about um, trees and h how trees will scream when they are uh, thirsty, but we can't hear yeah. them because they're, it's happening at ultrasonic levels. And, and you were kind of doing a, a parallel between the tree system of, of screaming, let's call it, and our vocal cords. And you were saying something like it was it was not that different between the two systems of producing sound. No, it's 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 there. There are not uh, very big differences, but uh, you're exactly right. That the difference is that it is uh, ultrasonic, for example, or that it is um, that the communication on trees on electrical ways is. Uh, up to 10,000 times slower uh, than, than our nerve system, for example. That's one of the reasons why it uh, was detected so lately, because uh, when you when you heard a tree, let's say five meters up the stem, and then you, you try to measure the electrical signal down the stem, uh, you, you, it, it could take hours to, to uh, measure a reaction. Uh, trees are so slowly, and therefore they were long regarded as not very much more than a, than a stone. And uh, the sound system trees are able to produce is, yeah, it's an ultrasonic sound. We don't know if, if that is really a warning sound or what it is, but we know they are producing sounds. And there are, I think in Germany, there is a, a pine plantation, um, which is connected to the uh, um, uh, internet. And uh, you there, the, the ultrasonic sound is reduced to to lower frequencies, so you can hear what the trees are doing. And that is from the university. I don't, but I'm I'm sorry. I think you have to research it in, in the web. But um, there are um, efforts to make that hearable. And uh, what, you, what else do we know? We know that, um, as I said, with the grass roots, that trees are also um, able to produce sound with the roots, like for example, elephants. Elephants, as we know, they are also um, uh, communicating with lo very low frequencies through their f uh, feet um, and yeah. through the through kilometers uh, through the soil. So trees are more near like elephants, and we know that's really amazing 
the trees are able to hear very good. Uh, they are, for example, they are able to hear with their roots flowing water in the underground. And that's research from the University of Perth. Uh, flowing water in the underground, and uh, they are able to differ between the sound of real water and the sound, uh, sound of MP3. And in MP3, there are some frequencies missing, the sound is compressed. Uh, for me, wow, to be honest, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm not a musician. I'm yeah. I, I, to be honest, I, I don't hear really a difference. I yeah. if, uh, I couldn't judge it. But but uh, musicians, they would say, oh no, that's horrible. MP3, there are so many frequencies missing, <laughs> and the tree is also able to judge if if the sound is is real or just a fake from a computer. So uh, uh, I, awesome. I I love this because um, they have so many senses. Um, and the, the, the latest research is if they we know the trees can see dark or bright light and uh, with that they, they are able to judge uh, which season is coming up or for example autumn or, or, or winter or fall they can feel the temperature uh, but uh, the latest research indicates that they may even see shapes not not just bright or dark but shapes perhaps what else they can see, we don't know, but uh, that's research which is going on, so we don't have uh, um, uh, hard facts, uh, yeah. good results, but they are first indicators that plants in general are able to see really. And that sounds like a fairy tale, I know, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's, yeah. Would they be able to do that with their leaves or bark <laughs> or roots or all of them? Um, we think so far that it are the leaves and in, in the in the buds, for example, there are there are uh, folded leaves. So the and and the uh, the upper layer of the, of the buds, uh, the, the the sun is light is shining through. So so um, trees are able to see uh, the whole the year round, even in winter time. So, but we don't know that exactly so far. But uh, but I love to hear such news um, and. Uh, the only thing is, uh, most lay people don't believe that, um, because uh, in scientific reports you can read about that very much. But scientific reports uh, are written in, in very, uh, very, very dry speech with uh, uh, technical terms and uh, without emotions, and that's very important for reading. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm more like a translator, and uh, I'm tr I translate the latest uh, news from the scientific community, and this sounds so crazy. Uh, that that many many people think no no now now he's gone one step too far it's it's yeah. now he's now in the king of fairy, fairy tales <laughs> like Robert, uh, and oh, what it, and all oh, trees are caring for the offspring and they are uh, uh, um, something like breastfeeding their 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 babies they are able to detect whether the seedlings belong to them if they are their own children let's say like this or not that, that sounds so crazy. Uh, uh, but I think the resistance against, because many people say, no, oh no, that's too much, is that they think in their inner, hmm, how should I deal with plants anymore? Uh, yeah. What should I eat? And that's exactly what, where, when I say, please relax. We are humans, that we are a special species, we are not no plants. I'm not able to make photosynthesis, so I have to eat other beings, and that's okay. The only yeah. question is, if I know all that, Perhaps here and there I may think about more plant-friendly ways to treat them, to use them, and that's all. Yeah. I mean, in a way, we we are alive thanks to them, and it's just the their their excretions is is our <laughs> sustenance. <laughs> um, that's a nice it, word. <laughs> it also has to do with uh, with different centers of perception right like we humans we only see what we can see because our brain be, uh, or thanks to our brain configuration yeah. right and other yeah. other organisms simply differ uh, yeah, i, I exactly. love that other part in your book where you said that neither grass nor young trees like it very much when cattle or deer munch <laughs> on them whether yeah. it's a wolf <laughs> ripping apart a wild boar or a deer eating an oak seedling, in both cases there is pain and there is death. But that's just life, right? That's yeah. how life works. Yeah, that's um, right. And, and for, for me, important is uh, is it is necessary whether it is necessary or when it is a, a, 
a normal behavior of this species, whether whether that is the human species or whether it is a wolf or whether it is a cow, then it's okay. Yeah. But when it is just for fun or just without thinking and you have a better way to do it, then then you could call that evil. But I don't like that um, uh, telling people is um, it um, in this way. I yeah. I more li like to love uh, to uh, to to bring them to fell in love with trees or with plants in general. And yeah, that's exactly uh, how I said it. Then you treat plants different. So important. Well, you know, it's important to have people like you who does who do this um, translation, this interpreting work between science and and us who are not scientists. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, okay, sorry. No, no. Um, I was just going to say that I saw you have a new edition of um, The Hidden Life of Trees with illustrations. And I also <laughs> heard you were working on a couple new books, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, illustrated edition. Um, many people said, wonderful book, but uh, we would love to have uh, pictures in it. And uh, yes, uh, the, the first try was without pictures. It's more for the fantasy of the, of the readers, because I love, love to have that. I don't know if you have an expression in English, like a head movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. which is playing, okay. playing in your head yeah, yeah. and uh, but for for many people who are not so uh, familiar with uh, forests and with trees it's helpful to have a picture for example of old chico the oldest tree in, in, in the world which is really a small tiny little spruce tree where you say wow that is, this tree is 10,000 years old it's it's incredible so uh, it's it, it's wonderful to have this illustrated edition um, to to uh, read it when you're sitting in your wheel uh, not not in, how do you say in the, the on, on the sofa uh, in, in, in your living room uh, in, in winter time and and dream about the, the forest in summertime so that's uh, the one edition uh, we have um, the the book on animals and uh, many people think hmm now this guy writes a book on animals because uh, the book of the hidden life, the, the book the hidden life of trees was so successful. But the animal book should have been the first book because my love to animals lasts much longer than than to trees. Okay. Um, since I was six years old, I, for example, I raised spiders in glasses and had uh, water turtles in a big aquarium on my desk, or I braided chicken out of make on, on the heating pillow of my grandma uh, and <laughs> after the, the chicken hatched it regarded me as its mother because i read that in, in scientific reports for children there are used books about about uh, nature and i read ah you could do that and i did it and, and it was a really wonderful experience to have such a little chicken with me uh, it became really very very old uh, sitting on the shoulder and uh, thinking that it, that it was human <laughs> and so um, and, the, and the third book of the trilogy is about the, the wisdom of nature how it all works together because we see nature and that is uh, just uh, let's say just 3, 300 years old uh, the way of uh, looking at nature like a big machine since the age of enlightenment and we think Every little being has its place, and when we um, uh, replace a wheel like this, then it will be, uh, we will, will see a reaction like this. But nature is much more complicating. And yeah. in, in this book, I'm telling the people, uh, for example, how, how uh, salmons are coming into trees, or how wolves change a river system, or... Uh, what what is uh, going um, what is in your drinking water every morning because you're a part of a big ecosystem in the underground. So um, this book uh, about the network of uh, nature uh, that will come out in in spring next year in in March, and that's that's uh, the trilogy because and uh, and the first contact with the publisher I wanted to write it all in one book, <laughs> and the of publisher course. said. Oh, just a moment, <laughs> just a little moment. Uh, that's a little bit too much for the readers. Yeah. Perhaps first you introduce the trees, and then you you introduce the animals. And when you're done with that, then you can uh, show how it is all combined. And so, yeah, and, and I think that it was a really good advice because I'm I'm sometimes on a, I'm on the fast lane. And I, hear I, you, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> I took my time. Yeah, that's that's uh, how I write. I'm I'm a fast writer. And I shorten uh, the things sometimes too much. And then the publisher said, no, please explain it. You have time. 
uh, tell all the little lovely stories you have experienced and they were completely right and i've learned i'm not ready with that but i've learned in the last decades to slow a little bit more down a little bit closer to tree speed beautiful beautiful <laughs> that's a wonderful work i'm really looking forward to to reading both of them um so they all communicate the plant kingdom communicates in electrical signals chemical signals and sound signals and more i guess I, i'm just like i just want to maybe start wrapping up with this idea about communication there there are more ways for example like um with with smell with with uh, taste okay. even by touching each other like i told about the the corn plants uh uh, there is a communication by touching each other. Uh, that, 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 that touching is not by purpose and not not conscious. But when they touch each other, there is something going on uh, concerning communication. But that's basic research. We don't know uh, what for. It is good. We don't know why they do that uh, and what what is the consequence of touching each other and signal the, uh, um, and and reporting this to the neighboring plants. Uh, that's basic research. That's uh, the the biggest problem I have that we uh, when we have one result we have ten new questions. So uh, I think <laughs> that's really a problem for me because uh, I, I would love to to have one day to say, wow, now I know what's really going on because. But uh, we have so many questions. Uh, but on the other hand, it's wonderful to to wake up every day and to have new informations. And uh, so so I think uh, I'm I will be learning my whole whole life long. Absolutely, yeah, I'm on the same page. It's so wonderful to be able to experience this today, right? That yeah. thanks to science we can understand all this from a from a place that helps most people um, understand the complexity of of living systems. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful right. work. Peter, is, is there anything you'd like to add that I haven't asked you about? Yeah, um, perhaps um, that we often misunderstand evolution. Evolution, uh, we think about uh, that it means the survival of the fittest. And uh, in, in, in Germany or in Europe or perhaps even in the United States, the, the fittest is sometimes mis misinterpreted as um, the strongest. But uh, to fit me, it just means that it fits in, in, into the environment. And that means that, uh, that uh, one way to fit very good in the in ecosystem is in a big social system. And in many, many cases, uh, that doesn't matter if, if there are wolves or orcas or trees, uh, there's cooperation. There's yeah. cooperation because that fits extremely good. Uh, um, when you're embedded in a, in a big community, when you get support, when you support others, and then then all together you can become very very old with very good health. And um, and on the other hand, trees are very slow, and that's a biological rule. Then uh, if when you are very slow, when you for example have a very slow youth grow, uh, growth, and when you live without uh, too much stress, you also can become very old. And that are two very important things for our society. We are also social beings. We, we are also suffering from stress and can, on the other hand, become very old and happy when we don't have too much stress. And um, I think it sounds too easy, but it's true. When we look at modern politics, uh, it doesn't matter when, uh, whether we look into the United States or into Europe, Hungary, for example, or Turkey or wherever. Uh, then we see that some political leaders are disregarding this this uh, fundamental rule and uh, but we are no individualists we are social beings and therefore uh, to live in harmony we should be careful what we are doing and some from time to time we should go into a forest trees are so much older and they have experienced much more mistakes and therefore they have developed for me a perfect uh, society and from time to time i think we can copy here and there a little bit Beautiful. <laughs> and where can people find out more about your work um, and your books? 
Yeah, we, I have a, a web page. Um, I founded a major academy after the um, success of the book because the question was, what should I do with this success? And uh, the only perfect answer for me was, um, I w want to do more for endangered forest. I want to do more for um, for the people to enjoy the forest. So there we offer um, guided tours from time to time, also in English. Uh, and uh, we we teach, for example, NGOs uh, how to how to deal with um, forest industry. Uh, yeah, we we offer um, things like a night in the forest without a tent um, and and things more. But uh, perhaps uh, what's interesting in um, in the next year in March, I will come back to the United States. I'm not sure uh, which uh, cities are covered. I know that it will be um, there is an event uh, on the, in the Sundance Resort of Robert Redford uh, on the 9th of March, uh, and I will be in New York. I know uh, perhaps in Washington, but so far perhaps. Uh, it's better to look at the web page from Greystone Publisher. Um, uh, um, they, uh, they publish the books in North America and they will show uh, which events will take place. So I would be very happy to meet um, some people from your audience in person. Wonderful, wonderful. Peter, danke schön. This was <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so we could have done that in German. If nein, I, would have nein. That. <laughs> <laughs> I only know a few words in German. Um, but thank you very much for your time. This was very insightful, very generous. Thank you so much for your, all your wonderful knowledge. Okay, Thomas. Thank you so much for the interview. I love love to talk and to to improve my English. So you, you gave me a good a good lesson for one hour. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Peter. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Take okay. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye.